evening, and thank you for coming out tonight. Our speaker tonight, uh, Professor Zeb Brocklin, uh, joined Georgia Tech in 2017, so he's a relatively new faculty member here. Uh, before that, he was an undergraduate at Caltech. He did his PhD work under our previous dean, uh, Paul Goldbart, at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. He was a research fellow at the University of Michigan and a postdoc at Cornell. Tonight, he's going to be talking to us about the science of origami, which I think is a really interesting topic that you will enjoy. At the end of the talk, we will have some time for questions. And so myself and James will uh, be walking around with these microphones. So if you do have a question, just raise your hand and wait for one of us to come to you with the microphone. And then uh, you can speak so that everyone can hear the question and Professor Rockland's answer. Without further ado, thank you. All right. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Greco. Uh, sound level's all right? Everyone hear me? Okay, great. So uh, I've been to a lot of these myself as an audience member, and I just wanted to quickly tell you a little about the series. Uh, it's been around since at least 2012. It's organized by Dr. Greco, who you just saw, and Stephanie Niebuhr, both of Georgia Tech's physics department. And the action item here is that if you go to Georgia Tech Physics YouTube channel, you can see many of the past lectures. So it's a craft, it's a hobby. I'm betting that most of you in the audience uh, got a chance to play around with it when you were young. Maybe some of you still play around with it. If you're really good, you might call it an art. It's certainly an art. I'm not particularly qualified to comment on art, but there will be lots of pretty origami in this talk. It's part of history. It's been around for almost 2,000 years. And it's part of culture as well, of course. It's most closely associated with the Japanese culture, uh, but it probably started in China, and many cultures have uh, employed it for various purposes since then. So this, this left-hand side is kind of the humanist side, and I'm going to be focusing more on the other side of origami. So it creates a lot of interesting math puzzles. It can reveal to us the structure of curved surfaces. It's useful for engineering. It's a great way of creating lightweight but strong structures that can collapse and fold up when they're not in use and can deploy to one or more useful shapes. There's also a science to it, something in between math and engineering, where we try to understand the fundamental properties that allow us to make origami and what the absolute limits of what we can do with it are. So I want to start off with something that most of us take for granted, which is solid objects. So what does it mean for matter to be solid? Well, what we mean is that it has a particular shape to it, some shape that it prefers. So this brick has this prismatic shape. In contrast, most of the matter in the universe is not solid. It's something like a fluid. So water, it will take the shape of its container. You can pour it. You can shear it. You can uh, pull it from side to side, and it'll move along with you. It'll only resist you if you pull really fast. You know, if you slap the surface of the water, it hurts. But if you go in slowly, uh, you will feel very little resistance. So there's lots of different kinds of solids, from the foams. This axis is the Young's modulus, a measure of the elastic stiffness. The right axis is the density. Foams are very lightweight but weak, up to metals and technical ceramics, which are about the strongest that we can have. And right here, we have composites, a little narrow region of this plot here. And that's closely related to what we want to talk about today, because in fact, the mechanical response of a structure is not based purely on its composition. It's not based only on its chemical structure or its microscopic structure. It's based on its shape. It's based on things that we can see and we can feel with our bare hands. So if we take a solid object and we pull on it, since it has that preferred shape, we're going to feel a force resisting our strain that we're applying to it. So when we pull this out and we stretch this out, there's a force that's coming back and acting on us to return it to its original shape. This is called Hooke's Law, named after Robert Hooke, a contemporary of Isaac Newton's in the Royal Society. And Hooke's Law states that the force increases the more you pull on it. If you stretch it twice as much, you get twice as much force as if you stretch it only a little bit from its original shape. And there's another factor here, which again is the thickness of the object. If I add three more layers here so that it's twice as thick, there's going to be twice as much force from pulling it apart from the same distance. That's not too surprising. But if we try to do something even a little bit more complicated, it gets a little hard to visualize. 
And in particular, I want to talk about bending. So suppose instead of just simple stretching, we bend our object. So if we bend our object, then now different things are happening in different layers. So if we look at this plot, we can see once we've bent it, then suddenly this layer is shorter than this layer. As I go out from this point, each layer stretches more and more. So in particular, we can have a neutral layer in the middle, and we can have something that's compressed on one side of it, and something that's extended on the other side. So not only is it the case that the more we bend it, the more we have something that's compressed and stretched, but now things get a little more complicated if we add more layers. Because if we add more layers, well, this next layer, if we add this, will be compressed even more than the layer before it and compressed even more. So suddenly the resistance to bending, the force we get back as we start to bend it, is not just increasing linearly with the thickness. It's actually increasing with the cube of the thickness. And what that means is if we take our initial structure, our thick elastic slab of matter, and we make it 10 times thinner, it's not going to get 10 times easier to bend. It's going to get 1,000 times easier to bend. So what we can do is we can take our structure and we can make it thinner and thinner. And as we make it thinner and thinner, it goes from something like a thick elastic block, which is roughly as easy to stretch as it is to bend, to a thin sheet that becomes very, very easy to bend, even easier than it is to stretch. So by controlling the shape of the thing, the macroscopic shape, we can drastically modify what kind of mechanical properties it has, what kind of mechanical response. So the key material here, of course, is paper. So prior to paper, we didn't have anything that's going to fold in the way we need it to fold to have origami. Paper's strong, it's stiff, and another useful feature, of course, is that when we bend it, when we bend it very tightly, we form a crease, a permanent crease. So we can permanently alter its structure. We can program its structure just by bending it and folding it, increasing it. So paper was invented almost 2,000 years ago in China. And uh, the history, as far as I can tell, is not terribly well known. Certainly, I can't make uh, much of it. And in fact, uh, after paper was invented, we know that people started to fold it very early on, still in China. And shortly after that, in Japan, as far as I know, we don't know for sure whether uh, the Chinese took paper folding to Japanese or whether it was discovered independently there. But before long, it was occurring in Korea and eventually in Europe as well. What's really surprising here is that if you look at the first origami book, that was in Japan in the year 1800, current era. So paper, 100 current era, the first book on paper folding, 1800. So that's a big gap, and that, that makes me a little uncertain on the history. But this is still quite an old book. So this is a book from over 200 years ago. And it shows something like the traditional Japanese crane here. On the right, we have something more like traditional uh, Chinese paper folding, which is a little more curved, a little less angular here. And again, all of this relies on the property of paper that it is foldable. So we can ask, how foldable is it? So for a long time, people thought that if you had a sheet of regular paper, not some sort of uh, space age material, but just regular cellulose, regular uh, wood matter, you could only fold it about seven or eight times. It just keeps getting thicker and thicker. Each time you fold it, it gets twice as thick, right? So if you fold it 10 times, that would be over 1,000 times thicker. And it was relatively recently that Brittany Gallivan, who at the time was a high school student, sat down, worked out the math carefully, and worked out what you would need to do to break that record. And she didn't just break it, she shattered it. So going from 8 folds to 12 folds, that's 4 additional folds. So that's 32 times, or excuse me, 16 times thicker if we go from 8, 32 times thicker if we go from 7. It's a little unclear what the previous record was. And what she did was she ordered some fancy, but not too fancy, it was commercially available toilet paper, about 4,000 feet, so this is about a mile of toilet paper. And working with a team of her fellow high school students, uh, they were able to fold it 12 times, easily making it into the uh, Guinness Book of World Records. And this would have been impossible if paper had acted like the elastic slab here, but the trick is with paper, there's nothing holding one layer to the other, so the layers can slide against each other. So there wasn't an enormous force that was generated when they were trying to fold this thing. 
So paper is already quite the wonder material, though of course we've come up with other materials that are useful for folding in different ways. Uh, but it can't do everything. And in particular, some of the things that we're interested in for uh, engineering applications are what we would call functional materials. So solar panels, of course, are very useful for capturing energy, for getting electrical energy. And they're particularly useful in outer space. So in outer space, you can't just plug in to wall power. And moreover, it doesn't work too well if you want to bring up chemical fuel, because chemical fuel weighs a lot. You have to keep carrying up more and more, whereas a solar panel can continue to capture energy from the sun. So solar panels are quite useful for space-based missions. But in a way, ground-based solar panels, of course, are awful for sending up into space because they're these big, broad, flat things. That's how they work. They want to be as broad as possible to capture as much of the sun's energy as possible. But that is not good for sending things up in a rocket. For sending things up in a rocket, of course, you want to fold them up as much as possible. And the nice thing with origami is that you're only going to have creases at a few places. So you can bend it at a few places. You can uh, design a new solar panel that will bend at the hinges here and you can collapse it down. And that's just what people do when they have solar panels for space-based missions. But this creates a problem. So origami is not trivial. So on the International Space Station in 2006, they ran into a problem. They were trying to extend the solar panels uh, automatically, so outside the living quarters of the uh, astronauts. And the panels got stuck. And that's a problem. If the panels don't deploy, they don't get power, the mission can fail. So it wasn't a big deal because this was a manned mission, so they could always send people out to manually unfold the panels, but they wanted to avoid that. So one thing they tried was to get an astronaut to exercise vigorously. So they have exercise equipment there that the astronauts use to keep up their muscle mass in zero gravity. And uh, the idea was just to exercise vigorously, try to shake the space station, get them loose. And they were uh, reduced to this sort of silly maneuver, which ended up not working, so they needed to do the spacewalk after all. Uh, because they're trying to avoid the spacewalk, which is hard, but not impossible for them. But it would have been impossible in an unmanned mission. So in an unmanned mission, if your origami doesn't fold right, and your origami has solar panels, the mission can fail. So origami is a serious business. It can take us to places farther than we've been before, or at least uh, more convenient than past ways of getting power up into outer space. And people have worked it out. So people have come up with a number of origami designs. So I think this one in particular was developed at uh, Brigham Young University. And the idea what, that we want is that, again, it should collapse into as small a space as possible and then expand out into as broad, flat, and low mass a surface as possible. And then it should be able to do this in only one way. So if you've ever played around with origami, you might have noticed that it's easy to misfold things. You miss a, crease somewhere, it gets a little off, things aren't quite where you want it to be. And you have to go back and fix it, which is fine with your human hands, but if you're in outer space, if you're relying on something that's essentially a very, very simple robot, it's not so easy to deal with misfolding. So you want this to be as robust and simple a mechanism as possible while meeting your criteria of being able to collapse and expand. So there are actually a lot of deployable structures. Most of them are quite ordinary, things that we take for granted. So a cardboard box, you can fold it up nice and flat uh, for delivery. And then when you want to put stuff in, you expand it, occupies a much larger volume, and it's pretty strong. It's mostly made out of paper, but it has these nice corrugations in it that make the panel stiff. Hoberman globe, just a novelty, but it similarly collapses and expands. Tents, again, collapse and expand. Umbrellas, very useful, collapse down, fit in your bag expand out, just a simple membrane to protect you from the rain. And I used to mention for a long time that sort of the holy grail of things was to get to foldable electronics, to get to something like a screen you could fold, but no, that nobody had figured out how to do that yet. So just very recently, a few companies have announced that they have worked out how to do foldable phones. I don't know how well they work, I guess we'll see, but the idea is that you know, if you want to pay a couple thousand dollars for a phone, soon you will apparently be able to get a phone that will unfold. So it folds up twice, so you get, I guess, twice the screen size. So maybe in 10 years, we'll all be able to unfold a laptop from our pocket, which would be really cool if it works. Uh, there's lots of other things that you can do with origami. So especially if you're not limiting yourself to what a purist would call origami, which of course would be paper. So if you're thinking instead more about foldable surfaces where you're allowed to put in the 
hinges by hand and you're allowed to use different materials. So the same group that came up with one of those uh, solar panel designs also developed a Kevlar system. So this Kevlar system, it collapses down, it's lightweight and compact enough that a single person can easily carry, carry it. And the Kevlar is, I shouldn't say bulletproof, nothing's really bulletproof, it's bullet resistant. So it can stop a bullet. And this is uh, intended to be used as a shield to protect uh, police officers when they're going into situations where they uh, expect to be shot at. And it's uh, broader and lighter weight than existing shields, so one person can carry it out and can protect uh, three people, at least uh, three people crouching down there. Other uses. In Dubai, again, this is not what a purist would really call origami. There's lots of open space between the panels and it's not made out of paper. But it does have these foldable panels. And what they're doing here, this is a building. It's a little hard to see the scale here. But each layer of this is a level of the building, a floor of the building. And in Dubai, of course, it gets very hot. The sunlight's very bright. And they open and close these panels in order to control the light and heat that's being applied into the building. So it's fully computerized. It can expand and collapse, opening up for more light or less light as the day goes by and as the year goes by. And then uh, this structure, as far as I know, is not really uh, in use now, but it's been demonstrated that it could be effective. What this is, is a metal heart stent. So a heart stent is meant to apply force and hold things open in the human heart. And of course, when you're inserting it, since you have to move the person's uh, body and organs out of the way, you want it to be as small as possible. So again, that's a job for origami. With origami, you can collapse it into this little thing that is mostly solid metal and then expand it out into something that has lots of empty space in between with a thin metal tube around it. So there's lots of different applications you can have where the general idea, again, is that you want to be able to get small and then get big. Get small, get big. Flip back and forth between different states, just unfold things around the edges here. Let's think about the best way to understand this mathematically. So when people started out doing origami, they were not, so far as we know, concerned with its mathematical properties. They were concerned with its aesthetic qualities. But eventually they developed a language that evolved into diagrams that look like this. And these diagrams are very useful for practical purposes. They tell you how to make the origami. They say fold here, now fold here, fold this, unfold this, do this, turn around like this. And at the end of the day, you're going to have uh, an origami bird here. Uh, mathematicians don't like that so much. It's a little complicated for them. What they want to do is they want to boil origami down into the simplest possible uh, description that they can find. So instead of step one, step two, step 16, what they say is, at the end of the day, just tell me uh, where the crease patterns are. And then tell me one more thing. So we have two different kinds of creases here. We have, uh, this is shown as red creases and blue creases. And these are called mountain folds and valley folds. So a mountain fold, if you look down at it from above, looks like a mountain. It's bending away from you. Valley fold, it looks like the edges of a valley sloping up towards you. So these two bits of information, where the creases are, these one-dimensional lines over our two-dimensional surface, and this is completely abstracted. So we're thinking of this as completely two-dimensional, completely flat before we start folding completely one-dimensional lines, infinitely thin, and all we're telling you about them is which ones fold up and which ones fold down. This particular design is not the same as this one. This one's called Darwin's Orchid by Robert Lang. If you've been reading uh, the names in the bottom here, you've already seen his name. You're going to see it a lot. He's a great origamist. I'm a big fan of his work, as many people are. And the question for us now is, what can we do with these crease patterns? What can we say about them mathematically? How can we... Uh, make this quantitative and precise. And we want to narrow things down. We want to talk about a single vertex here. So a vertex is just what we would call the point where the creases come together. So here we have a vertex with six creases attached. Here we have one with one, two, three, four, five vertices attached, if we count the outer edges there, here with four vertices attached. So at that point, we can ask ourselves, I'm not going to worry about the whole sheet. I'm not going to worry about how, how all of these vertices work together. I'm not going to worry about all the folds that I can put in. I'm just going to start by asking about a single vertex and ask the question that mathemat 
mathematicians like to ask that turn out, turns out to be quite revealing is, is it flat foldable? And by flat foldable, I mean it starts off flat. So it starts off flat, but can I put folds in here? Can I fold each of these creases around the vertex and make it flat again? So if I take something like this, if I just fold it up, this is flat folded. So I've given it some folds, I have a single vertex here, and it's still flat, it's still this very thin thing, as opposed to some configuration like this where I've put folds, I have, I've changed the angles here, I've changed the angles of the faces against each other, but it's not flat at this point. So the question that we're gonna ask ourselves is, is the vertex flat foldable? Partly, this is for the reason that we already talked about, that being able to fold flat is very useful for deployment. We can collapse it into a tiny little shape and put it away in a tiny little space until we need it. But partly, it just leads to a lot of subtle and rich math that reveal a lot about the structure of this crease pattern. So the first theorem, so this is a mathematical theorem, and it's named after Maikawa. It was discovered uh, more or less independently by Maikawa, Justine, and Murata, and not in that order. And what they found out is that if you take a vertex, if it can be folded flat, then the difference between the number of mountain and valley folds that come together at that vertex must be two. The number of mountain folds number, minus the number of valley folds must be two or negative two. And the reason, if you're good at 3D visualization, is not too hard to see. So if we take a vertex like this, and we go around, and we go over a mountain fold, and we look at when it's in the flat state, when it's flat folded, we look at how much we've turned, the mountain fold is gonna take us on, say, a half turn. And if we go through another mountain fold, we're gonna have another half turn. But if we hit a valley fold, it's gonna be a half turn the other way. So if we add up all those half turns, and we come back to where we started on the origami. So we make a full circle, come back to where we started. As we've gone around, we must have made a full turn in one direction or a full turn in the other direction. So we must have netted a total of two half turns one way or two half turns the other way. And since mountain folds are half turned one way, valley folds are half turns the other way, that means that the number of mountain folds and valley folds has to differ by two. So let me try to show you this. So I should say sometimes people do this as a demo, so if you happen to have a sheet of paper, you can try it in the audience. It can get a little tricky though. It doesn't always work out quite the way we expected, so I wanted to just do it once when I knew it was gonna work. So I'll start off with a flat sheet, so something like this, nothing special, then just start folding it, and just keep folding it till you get to a point where it's still folded flat. So I just take this, I fold it once, I fold it twice, I fold it three times, that seems good enough. And now I unfold it. So I unfold it and I look at my creases. So I look at all my creases and I, I'm gonna label them. I'm gonna say which one of these is a mountain fold and which one's a valley fold. So this is clearly a mountain fold. The crease is closer to us than the sides here. This one is a valley fold. The valley is further away from us than the sides on either side of it. So if I go through and I label the mountain folds and valley folds, it's a little hard to see here, but on five of these I have solid lines. The solid lines indicate mountain folds, dashed lines indicate valley folds. Five minus three equals two. So there we have it. No matter how many times you do it, no matter what tricks you try to play, if you play by the rules, you're gonna have that the number of mountain folds and the valley folds are gonna differ by two. But is this enough? If I just choose the numbers of mountain folds and valley folds, it turns out that that doesn't guarantee that it's flat foldable. So this is an if statement, but not an if and only if statement. If it's flat foldable, then this is true. But if this is true, it's not necessarily flat foldable. So we have to go a bit further than Maikawa went. We have to go to Kawasaki's theorem. So Kawasaki uh, starts off by labeling mountain and valley folds, and we see that we have three mountain folds and one valley fold here. He, he labels the two different kinds differently here. But he also looks at the angles between the creases. So I can look at the angle that I rotate through as I go from one crease to the other. So I get these four angles in this case because I had four creases. And Kawasaki's theorem says that a vertex is flat foldable if and only if. So this is a more powerful statement. This is a guarantee now. We can alternately add and subtract the angles between creases to get zero. So in this case, we say alpha one minus alpha two plus alpha three minus alpha four. That has to add up to zero if this is gonna be flat foldable. It doesn't always add up to zero. There's no guarantee that it's gonna add up to zero. But if it's gonna be flat foldable as opposed to just foldable, it has to add up to zero. And we can see this from this diagram, again, if we're good at visualizing uh, how things go. 
So as we fold this, some of these angles are sort of face up and some of them are face down. And if we look at how we rock back and forth as we go through the angles, as we go for, through the first one, I might rotate by alpha one to the right. And then the other one is flipped. So I'm gonna rotate by alpha two to the left, then alpha three to the right, then alpha four to the left. And when I do that, I have to come back to where I started because again, I've gone around in a circle around my vertex, come back to where I started. And if it was flat folded, I have to come back to where I started. So I have to have alpha one plus alpha three is equal to alpha two plus alpha four. And we can check that too. So I can keep going with my same uh, bit of origami here. And again, it's a little hard to see, but what I've done is I've just labeled the alternating uh, angle. So I have this angle, then this next angle, then this next angle. And now I'm gonna break a cardinal rule of origami and break out the scissors. So I break out the scissors and I cut it up and I just see what happens when I take all of the alternating angles and balance them against all the other alternating angles. And what I get is that indeed, I have half the angles together add up to exactly 180 degrees. That's not always gonna be true, of course, but it always has to be true if it's flat foldable. And the other half also adds up to 180 degrees. So this is now a guarantee. If this is true, I know that there must be some way to flat fold it. So that's the vertex. The vertex we can do. The vertex, at least for flat foldability, is not too bad. If we look at general folding, if we say what are all the folds we can do that are not necessarily flat folds, it can get rather complicated but it's still just a single vertex. But if we have something more complicated, if we have this big crease pattern here, we could ask, is this flat foldable? So now it's not just a question of, can I get one vertex flat? It's, can I get all of them flat at the same time? This is a harder problem, and it leads to another favorite of mathematicians, which is a coloring problem. So we can do this, we can take the faces, and we can color them. So we can take two colors, so this is a two coloring, and we can say, I'm gonna color every face by one of two colors. And my rule is gonna be that if two faces share a crease, then they can't be the same color. So what I can do is I can start off with one face and say, okay, all the faces that share a crease with it, I'm gonna color the other color. And then all the faces that share creases with them, I'm gonna color the first color. And if I go through this, it turns out that a flat foldable sheet, so not just a single vertex, has to have this property that no two faces that share a crease are the same color. And that's because if I do fold it flat, then in a sense, each of my faces is either face up or face down. So I can label the face up ones with one color and the face up down ones with the other color. And if two faces share a crease, then one of them must be face up and one of them must be face down. So I can do this two coloring. So now I have two things. I can say, if I wanna make my whole sheet flat foldable, if I want to completely control it in this way, I need the individual vertices to be flat foldable, which I can do from Kawasaka's theorem. And if I also need to have this additional structure that says the faces have to be two colorable. The question is, is this enough? And the answer is no. It turns out that we can have all the vertices working and we can have this two colorability and it's still no guarantee that the whole thing will ever fold flat. In fact, generically, it won't. And it turns out the problem of working out when sheets fold flat and when they don't is quite difficult. It's computationally difficult. It's what's called NP-hard. It's something that we can check in a good amount of time. So if I tell you, here's how you assign the mountain and valley folds, then you can check to see if it works pretty easily. You can just go through and say, okay, do I have two more mountain folds and valley folds at each vertex? No problem. But if I wanna find something that actually does that, it takes a very long time on the computer to actually do that. So there are limits to what we can do with computers. So I wanna shift now back to the aesthetic side. And this is another one of uh, Robert Lang's pieces. At, at the time he made it, it was certainly his most well-known piece. So this is the Black Forest Cuckoo Clock. And it doesn't show up uh, all in this image, but even if you zoom in very closely and you look at the fine details, you see details on details. You see these nice curved leaves, you see this nice pendulum, and it's even a little functional in that if you pull on the pendulum, the cuckoo and the cuckoo clock comes out. Uh, it tells the time, of course this doesn't actually turn, but it's still right uh, twice a day. So you can have all of this complicated structure that again, this was just a single sheet, single flat sheet, nothing special, no glue, no cutting, uh, that Lang was able to make. Uh, and he's able to make a lot of stuff. If you go to his website, you can find yourself wasting a lot of time looking at the different pieces he's realized. 
So this is the emperor's scorpion. Some of you might know that story, but it's not important to admire the piece. So again, a lot of fine detail. Uh, and you might say, well, actually, a scorpion is not so hard. A cuckoo clock is not so hard. I mean, the scorpion has a sort of hard carapace. Uh, can we do something that feels like it has a little more personality? And perhaps to show that, uh, Lang did a uh, human face. So I think this is all one piece except maybe for the glasses. The glasses, I think, might have been uh, a different sheet to start with. Uh, this is C.P. Snow. Some of you might know the name. So I think he's most known these days uh, for, he was a scientist who also wrote books, and he complained that uh, people who loved the arts and humanities didn't talk to the people who uh, loved science and math and vice versa. So perhaps origami is a, an attempt these days to bring those two different uh, cultures, he called them the two cultures, uh, together. So that's probably, I'm guessing, why Robert Lang uh, chose his face to sculpt, or to make out of origami, I should say. And how do we do this in general? So there, there's an old joke uh, uh, that's in this Dilbert cartoon that says, how do you, fold an, uh, how do you sculpt an elephant? Dilbert says, it's easy to. All you do is you start with a chunk of marble and remove everything that doesn't look like an elephant. Didn't actually work out for him. He says this chunk of marble didn't have an elephant in it. So of course, in practice, sculpture is not easy. But in theory, at least, it's hard, where if I say, here's the shape I want you to sculpt, then the algorithm is just remove everything on one side of that shape and keep everything on the other side. Obviously, that's not how you do origami. So if you want to make uh, something like this origami elephant that uh, Bernie Payton made, so again, single sheet here. The tusks are just from the other side. The other side's white. The main side is gray. And then there's a baby <laughs> elephant here. Elephant's kind of hard. You know the story of the blind men and the elephant. The elephant has lots of different parts to it. It has the pillar-like legs, the snake-like tail, the broad flanks sharp tusks, the flappy ears, and then the trunk. So the trunk has these cool wrinkles in it. So there's a professor here, David Hu, who uh, loves talking about how these wrinkles enable the trunk to be so sensitive and so dexterous. But that doesn't tell us how to make an origami elephant. And uh, there's a problem with this. The problem is that if we look at the elephant and think of it as a two-dimensional surface, and we look at our sheet of paper, we have a problem. The elephant is very curved. Pretty much anything we want to make is very curved. So some origami, you know, like the origami crane, it's pretty angular. It's not very curved at all. But a lot of the modern shapes that people do like to make are curved. So how do you make a curve from a flat surface? It's a hard problem. It's a problem that has bedeviled people for a long time. Uh, so could we fold a sphere? Can we fold up our paper and make a sphere? And this is a problem that map makers have encountered. So uh, the problem they have, of course, is that we know that the Earth is round, but we like our maps uh, deployable. We like to be able to fold them up. We like to put them on sheets of paper. So we need to make our maps flat. So maps take the round Earth and map it. That's what mathematicians say. They got it from the map makers. They map it to a flat sheet. And the Mercator projection is one of many. You can, again, you can look all these up. They all have their advantages. They all have their disadvantages. There's no killer projection because there's no projection that can do all the things that we'd like it to do. So in particular, the Mercator projection preserves the angles between things. So like this map, if we start off with the square grid and map it like here, if we look at it, the 90 degree angles stay 90 degree angles. But some of the squares stretch, and some of them contract. And that's what's happening here. So if we take the Mercator projection, things are really getting stretched out of place, especially near the poles. So it's not too bad if you're at the same latitude. But at the poles, like Greenland, things are getting all out of place. So if you look at this Mercator map, you compare Greenland, which is purple, to Africa, which is red here, they look like they're about the same size. Maybe Greenland's even a little bigger. Actually, of course, Greenland is tiny compared to Africa. So this is stretching things all out of place, which creates its own issues for accurately representing the world, which is part of the reason that Google Maps recently, like recently in the last few years, switched from having flat maps to when you zoomed out enough, making it look like the surface of a sphere. Uh, but we have this problem, if we can't do that, we have this problem that says, how do we get from our flat space to our sphere without trying to do this awful stretching thing? So with origami, the problem, of course, is that we can't stretch paper, right? Paper just does not have a lot of stretch in it. So if you really pull the heck out of it, it might stretch by about 5%, but it won't be good for much afterwards, and it'll tear soon after that. So there are two different kinds of bending. 
it turns out. So some of you may know this. So it turns out it's easy to take a sheet of paper and bend it up into a cylinder, right? No problem at all. Uh, but it's not easy at all to get to a sphere. In fact, it's impossible to do it purely by bending the paper. You would need to stretch it. And what's the difference between the cylinder and the sphere? Well, it turns out there's this thing called Gaussian curvature. And the way we see it is we pick a point on our two-dimensional surface, and then we draw two perpendicular lines. And we're drawing them along the surface, so they'll start to curve. And we choose an angle so that one curves as much as possible. So we get to the, what's called the principal axes. And we just measure how curvy these are. And in particular, what we do is we measure how big a circle it would take to make this curve. And we take the inverse of its radius. So the bigger the circle, the less curvy it is. And to get the Gaussian curvature, we just multiply these two things together. So lots of different ways we can do this. And what it reveals, actually, is that by this measure, when I've taken this flat sheet and folded it up into a cylinder, I haven't done anything at all. So the reason being that even though I've got one type of curvature, another one's perfectly flat. So when I multiply them together, I still get 0. In contrast, the sphere has positive curvature. Something that's shaped like a saddle has negative curvature, because one bends one way and one bends the other. And if we make our sphere smaller, it's actually more curved, because uh, the smaller the circle here, the higher we define that curvature. This is a useful exercise, because it gets us to uh, what's called Gauss's theorem egregium. And uh, Gauss, who was arguably the greatest mathematician in history, said that if you take a curved surface and develop it upon any other surface or whatever, which is to say if you bend it, the measure of curvature, so he means the measure of Gaussian curvature, but he can't call it that because he's not an egomaniac, uh, in each point remains unchanged. So what that's saying is no matter how much we bend our paper, how much we fold it, we can never really honestly go from a flat sheet to something like an elephant which has Gaussian curvature. So we have to cheat. Origami is all about this kind of cheating. And how do you do this? So to do this, we're going to turn to Tomohiro Tachi, who's a true artist and also a scientist. Uh, OK, we don't need the sound. Uh, uh, no? OK, whatever. OK, so we have the sound playing softly here. This is the crease pattern. So this is the crease pattern. And the way that guys like uh, Tomohiro Tachi and Robert Lang get their crease patterns is they don't really do it with uh, our uh, puny human minds. The, these days, it is computer-assisted. So we have a computer-assisted way of generating crease patterns like this, which is a large part of the reason that we're able to generate more sophisticated origami than we could in previous generations. Really, if you look at his technique, he's just using his hands and these little clips. So even the purists are fine with having these little clips. He's going to take them out by the end. And he's just going through, and he's generating this crease pattern on this sheet of paper. And he's using the clips, of course, to hold it in place, because there are many more uh, creases than he has fingers. And it's taking him some time. It takes quite a bit of time. Even once you have this pattern, even once you've done a few test runs, it takes a long time to get all these, because the computer doesn't tell you what order to fold these in. The computer doesn't worry about the fact that you can't just take paper and pass paper through paper, that it'll bump into itself. So it's a problem and a half just to figure out how you're actually going to get things slipped through here. And Tachi has chosen to try to make a bunny. So the bunny is a little like C.P. Snow's face. It's harder than a scorpion in that it has all these nice, soft, smooth curves. It's also an allusion to something that some uh, computer scientists around here are probably familiar with, which is the Stanford bunny, which is just an image that was used as sort of a benchmark for how uh, good you were at uh, creating and storing a computer image. So this is a harder problem, of course, in the sense that we're trying to create a physical object and a surface. But he's going at it. It takes him, again, quite some time. So if you watch carefully, uh, you have to be quite careful. At one point, he changes his shirt out for a similar shirt, because it takes two days to do this. So he's doing this. And if you look at this, you're actually starting to see a curved surface. And the reason this works, even though Gauss's theorem says it shouldn't, is that we aren't removing the material. So if we could remove material, we could change the Gaussian curvature. We aren't removing it, but what we're doing is we're creating a flap and tucking it away. So the bunny has a lot of extra material that is tucked away inside the surface, which is why the bunny ends up being so much smaller than the sheet that we started with. If you just look at the surface area of the bunny that's showing, it's much less than the surface area of the sheet, because the bunny has a lot of paper just tucked in inside it. So he's getting close here. I think the ears are the hardest part. I think the ears here are the ones here with the greatest density of folds here. 
And we're almost to uh, the end here. And I'm just going to skip to the, okay, we just got a few seconds left. Okay, so there we go. So, so bunny. So we get this nice curved surface coming from this nasty, nasty uh, fold pattern. And really, there's no way to do this except with the human hand. There's no technology we have that can equal uh, what nature has given us. Um, now I want to switch to something that is kind of at the opposite extreme of that, which is not this complicated, intricate pattern where every bit is different from every other bit, but instead something that we might even think of as a material, this nice repeating pattern. So we have this repeating structure that kind of looks like the repeating structure of a crystal, of course, on a much larger scale. Uh, this is due to Kyoro Miura, who's a Japanese astrophysicist, and he designed it as an astrophysicist aid in space missions, and indeed in 1996, it was deployed. The uh, solar panels unfolded successfully, so successful use of origami here. And the nice thing about this is it's so symmetric. Each panel is a parallelogram, and it's really just the same parallelogram translated and flipped around over and over. So in a sense, what we have is just one vertex between four parallelograms that repeats over and over. So we can fold a single vertex with four creases coming out of it, so we can fold the whole thing. It's really easy to make, even if you have no particular talent for working with your hands, you just have this nice pattern that you put in, and it collapses. So this is definitely what we call flat foldable. I can get it down into just a single panel all sitting on top of each other. Easy to do, easy to make bigger, easy to make in different contexts. Uh, so uh, Glaucio Polino, who I mentioned before, has folded up into tubes. So you have these nice tubes where you just sort of squeeze them and they extend. You can make things like bridges and walls out of them, and then they again just collapse right down, make them at the human scale or a bit larger. Uh, you can do more things with the Mira Ori. So the Mira Ori, I like to say, is a little like uh, the fruit fly is for geneticists, where it's just the most useful, simple, basic pattern that we can start adding stuff to and seeing different things. So you can do things like here we have different layers of the Mira Ori, and then oops, this is what you'd call a defect, except the people who made it put it in on purpose. We have suddenly three layers become two layers here, so we have this defect that radically changes how it folds and unfolds. We can also have interfaces between two different kinds of Mira Ori. The interfaces act as hinges, so we're starting to modify its mechanical response. We're starting to take this one thing that it had and add in more and more things by changing the structure. So each little bit is still the Mira Ori, the same pattern, but now we're adding patterns on top of patterns. And you can keep going. You can say, how many shapes can I program? And the answer is pretty close to all of them. You can get pretty arbitrary shapes. So a number of people, this was published a few years ago, and uh, Al Mahadevan was here recently, and he spoke about this, so I, I borrowed some of his graphics for the uh, promo figure you might have seen advertising this talk. And what he and his group do is they start with the Mira Ori. Let's see, so, okay. So I, I'm missing a graphic here, but what they do is they start with something that looks like the Mira Ori here, except instead of this regular repeating pattern, they slowly modify it so that the Mira Ori here isn't quite the same as the Mira Ori over here. And when they do that, they're able to tuck things away. So they're able to tuck extra material away, just like Tachi did with his bunny. And they're able to tuck more material away in different places. So what they can do is they can get this nice curved surface. They can get essentially any curved surface they want, though if it's symmetrical like this, if it's the same as we rotate around its axis, that certainly makes it easier in practice. But in theory, it doesn't need to be. So what they do is they start with a flat sheet and Again, in theory, it's easy to do. In practice, it's a little complicated. They're able to just pop it up, turn it into a base. And then they cheat a little origami-wise. They have to actually you know, tape it together at the end here. Otherwise, there'd be a loose end here. And they're able to get pretty much any shape they want in this way. The way they're doing it is with a computer algorithm that allows them to approximate any curved surface. And to do this, it's useful to be able to go small. So the more intricate we can make this what you might call a metamaterial, in that it has this structure on top of its microscopic structure that's changing how its mechanical response works. If you can make it finer, you can get closer to the surface you want. So this is 10 strips per cell. And you can see it's a curved surface, but you can really see that it's angular, it's blocky, it doesn't look exactly like that. 
100 st strips, at least in the graphic with this quality, it looks almost perfectly like a smooth surface. 1,000 cells per strip, it's pretty much perfect. So the more intricate you can make it, the more control you can have over different kinds of shapes you can get with your origami surface. Now I want to switch a little bit. So we've been talking about origami as a human endeavor. And if you think about it, then what human beings have wanted to do with origami uh, is, are things that nature has wanted to do with origami. So nature has wanted broad, flat surfaces for things like bird wings. So this is origami, but it's also meant to suggest an actual bird with actual wings. So for bird wings, and before them, insect wings. And hey, what about plants? So you have things like petals, you have things like leaves. What is a leaf but a natural solar cell? And like the artificial solar cell, it wants to be broad and flat and thin and strong, and it wants to get its functional material, it wants to get its chlorophyll out there exposed to the sunlight. So origami is useful for nature, and nature seems to have figured out how to do it. Again, if we're using the term origami a little loosely here. So if we look at a fold in a leaf, we can see, indeed, this looks very much like something we could make with origami. This is nice, so what Richard Feynman, the great physicist and great explainer of science said is, what I cannot create, I do not understand. He was doing quantum electrodynamics, so that was a problem for him. It's hard to create an electron. Uh, but for a folded leaf, uh, the quote is not about quantum electrodynamics, of course. Uh, with a leaf, it's not so bad. We can figure out how to make the macroscopic structure of a leaf, or this is a sketch of an insect wing. And it turns out, so, uh, some people just keep coming up. We're back to Mahadevan again. And Mahadevan showed that you could get origami without anyone doing the folding. Nature could figure out how to fold it without some sort of central planner doing the folding. So panel A here is just regular origami. This is something that an actual human had to do with his or her hands. The natural process is also reminiscent of it. The leaf, again, at this uh, quality of graphic, could almost be uh, an origami object. And down here in C, this is something quite different. This is something that's on a smaller scale. I forget how small exactly. And it's also something where you had an experiment where no one was doing the folding. All you had was interactions that were happening on the surface of this object. And it pulled it into this sort of wrinkled pattern that if you squint a little, it's not perfect. If you squint a little, it does look very much like the Mira Ori fold. And even simpler, Mahadevan showed that if you take a simple equation, so a simple equation a little bit like, you know, uh, things roll downhill that you want to minimize energy, and you put in simple interactions, and you ask these simple interactions to create a surface that minimizes the energy, what you get is this wavy pattern here, which again looks rather like the mirror ori. So even very simple action principles, very simple equations, the types of equations that we know that nature can obey without any great complication, can generate things like origami. And again, as we've seen with wings and leaves, that's often a useful thing to do. And in a sense, this is definitely not strictly origami. In a, strict, in a sense, though, folding at least is something that is fundamental to nature. So if you take flexible biopolymers, proteins, they form the structures of the human body and, of course, of other organisms' bodies. And even if you've got the structure right, even if you put all the molecules along the line here where you wanted them to go, it's not necessarily going to function properly. So they're quite a few diseases that are associated with protein misfoldings. So you also need to fold it properly. And if you can fold it properly, you can get, of course, a wide variety of biological functions. And if you can't, you can't. So one thing that animates people is to try to at least approach, we're very far from it, this level of mastery that nature has of being able to take these molecules and not only make these molecules down at this tiny scale, but fold them to put them into the shape that we want. In practice, it's quite difficult. It's difficult even to simulate a protein folding. It takes a supercomputer uh, quite a bit of effort to simulate it for a few seconds. So uh, I'm going to step away a bit from origami and get to something related. So this is kirigami. So origami is paper folding from the Japanese, of course. Kirigami is cutting paper. So we're breaking the cardinal rule of origami. We have to leave the scissors in the drawer. And we get more freedom than the origami and also less structure. So I mentioned that uh, origami and kirigami can be a uh, cultural event. Uh, hopefully many of you recognize 
the uh, cultural phenomenon this is. This is the uh, Millennium Falcon, and I guess uh, Darth Vader and uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi fighting in the corner there. Uh, so if we have the freedom to cut, we can do some interesting things. So what people at Cornell did was they cut pieces out of the paper, and they pulled on it. And suddenly, it acted like a spring. The paper starts to rotate, and it can really stretch quite a bit. That's quite different from uh, origami, right? No matter how I fold this, I'm never going to get it to go longer than this. This is as long as it can go before I start cutting. But with kirigami, we can go further. And what people did, the Cornell group wasn't just interested in paper. They were interested in the thinnest paper possible, graphene. I'm sure many of you have heard of graphene, so it's a single atom thick carbon. So carbon is also what paper is made of, but the structure is quite different here. Uh, so it's made every time you take a pencil to paper, but it wasn't isolated until 2004 by Gaiman Novoselov, earning them the uh, Physics Nobel Prize. Major advances also occurred here at Georgia Tech. It has incredible electronic properties, uh, but for our discussion today, we have the question that we're more interested in is, can we bend it? And that turned out to be a hard problem. So the Cornell group, uh, the first author was Melina Blees, uh, the senior author, uh, Paul McEwen, uh, figured out, this is very hard to see in the scan here, but if you look carefully, you'll see something uh, like this here, the same pattern. So they took the exact same pattern, and they cut it in here. And part of the reason they did that was it turns out that graphene is not actually as easily foldable as you might think. It's very, very thin, and we said that very thin things should fold easily. But it turns out that graphene always has little ripples in it. So instead, it acts sort of corrugated. So it acts much thicker than it actually is. So it's not so easy to bend, so they had to cut holes in it. And when they did, they were able to stretch it out and form these tiny, ultra-thin springs. So the idea here is that by cutting out graphene, we can create these new patterns and these new structures that give us some of the smallest uh, mechanical parts uh, anyone's ever seen. And then later, some of the same people, uh, including uh, Mark Miskin, who showed me this in the uh, lab at Cornell, it was quite awesome to see, uh, did figure out how to fold. So the way they figured out how to fold goes back to our, one of our very first slides here, where they took graphene, and then they stuck silicon dioxide on it, glass. And then they also stuck some rigid panels on it. And why did they do that? Well, they're going to heat it up. And when they heat it up, glass expands. Graphene also expands in theory, but not as much. And we know that when one layer is expanding and one layer is not expanding so much, that's bending. That's bending right there when one's expanding and the other's not and they're stuck together. So just by heating it up, by shining a laser on it, they're able to fold up objects. So they can take this initially flat thing, heat it up, and it'll fold up into a cube. So again, similar to macroscopic graphene, we can fold things up, start from a flat object, make a three-dimensional object. This thing's really cool. So this thing, they don't put in the rigid panels. They just have a graphene strip. It's hard to see here. But they have a graphene strip with the silicon dioxide, and they just fire a laser at it. They fire a laser at it. It goes wild. It coils up. And this can act as a little grabber. If you have an object there you want to grab, just shine the laser on this strip, and it'll curl up. It'll coil around it. Grab and hold on to it a bit. Turn the laser off. It'll release. So I'm about out of time here. But there's other stuff I wish I could tell you about. So there's the notion of memory. So it turns out that paper, when you crumple it, remembers that you crumpled it. In fact, it even remembers how you crumpled it. And it can remember it for a surprisingly long time. So one of the things that I did with my research that uh, I really love is that we took a system that was not at all origami. We took a system of magnetic spins, microscopic magnetic spins that were interacting. And we mapped that system onto origami. It wasn't origami, but we said, hey, the way that these spins can move is equivalent to the folding of paper. It's exactly equivalent. And moreover, we know a lot about how we can fold paper. So by crafting this origami analog of our magnetic system, we were actually able to make new predictions about the new ways that the uh, degeneracy of the spins, the new ways that the spin system could deform itself that was equivalent to folding the origami system. Just about out of time here. So thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. Hi. Okay, um, so I had a question about the, or the folding part of mm -hmm. the origami. So it, 
I noticed it took, you know, you said it took two days mm -hmm. from to fold that, that bunny. Mm -hmm. Is there any sort of algorithmic or mathematical assistance required to figure out how you can fold it, you know, so that paper is folding through itself? Because I would imagine that would take, yeah. that would add a lot of time to the process. Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, I don't actually know the answer. So the algorithm is that it can tell you, here's the curved surface I want, here's how you need to put the creases in, and I know that very much of what something, of what someone like uh, Itachi does is really just eyeball it by looking at what's happening locally and try to modify things locally. And the idea is if you're doing something off in one corner, it's not gonna affect things off all the way over here. So you can kind of eyeball the notion of there being a geometrical distance that is gonna assure that you don't have to worry so much about what's happening there in practice. I don't know if there's also a computer algorithm that is gonna give him some clue as to say, start on this area, now start on this area, now move over here. Hi. So um, you mentioned that um, when he was folding the uh, large piece of paper, that uh, the only way to really do it was, was with human hands. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any examples like online of um, somebody trying to automate the process? Yeah, so that's, that's a big topic right now. So partly because people are very interested in microscopic origami. So for macroscopic origami, doing it by hand works all right. You know, it's labor intensive. It's not something that you would use for mass market, but for the origami applications macroscopically, it works. Microscopically, it's quite hard because we're actually better at making really small sheets than we are at uh, bending really small sheets. So something like I showed in the last couple slides where what they did was they uh, pasted panels onto it and they pasted silicon dioxide onto the graphene and then they heated it up. That's one way of doing self-folding origami. There's other ways to control it other than temperature. There are things like adding moisture. Moisture can also cause this differential swelling that causes one substance to bend in a way that others don't. There's chemistry, there's salt content, there's all sorts of different knobs that you can try turning. There are fields, there, there's uh, origami that couples to magnetic fields. So there are different ways. They have their advantages and their disadvantages. There's origami robots where the ro origami is actually actuated and has little uh, pieces that are hooked up to batteries that can make the origami go from a flat state to picking up and walking along by itself. So there's lots of different ways to do it. It's a really interesting area. I have a question for you, Professor Rockland. Uh, how did you first get interested in origami in a scientific or mathematical sense? Yeah, so it, it kind of grew out of uh, my more general interests, which are in flexible structures and the mechanical response of things that have complicated structures, not at the chemical level, not at the molecular level, but at larger scale. So some of the things I look at are uh, uh, systems that you could think of as a bunch of point particles connected by rods. And for some of these, they look very much like origami. And for some of these, we realize these are actually mathematically equivalent to origami. And one of the things that really surprised us, uh, something that I'm working on with my student James there, is that adding that extra structure just creates this incredible new layer of math where you get these new results that you don't have. You have things that worked before that no longer work, and then you have new knobs that turn on, new things that you can control uh, one of the things I study is topology, so there are things called topological invariants, new numbers that you can have with origami that you can't have with the other mechanical structures we were looking at. So it just ended up being something that, in addition to, I think, things that we can all appreciate on the aesthetic level, it ended up being a very uh, fruitful area for us to look at. Great, okay, let's uh, thank Professor Rocklin one more time. <laughs>